Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, bringing the world's top experts right to you. Introducing your hosts, Matt Bodner and Austin Fable. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, with more than 5 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we bring on author Charles Duhigg to share the secrets and the science of building better habits. Are you a fan of the show and have you been enjoying the content that we put together for you? If you have, I would love it if you signed up for our email list. We have some amazing content on there along with a really great free course that we put a ton of time into called How to Create Time for What Matters Most in Your Life. If that sounds exciting and interesting and you want a bunch of other free goodies and giveaways along with that, just go to successpodcast.com You can sign up right on the homepage, that's successpodcast.com, or if you're on your phone right now, all you have to do is text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. In our previous episode, we brought on polymath Luke Burgess to discuss the fundamental question of desire. Why do you want the things you want in life? Be sure to check out our previous episode. Now for our interview with Charles. Charles Duhigg is a Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist and senior editor at the New York Times. Charles is the author of The Power of Habit, which spent over two years on the New York Times bestseller list, and more recently, Smarter, Faster, Better, also a New York Times bestseller. Charles graduated from Yale University, Harvard Business School, and has been featured in This American Life, NPR, Frontline, and much more. Charles, welcome back to the Science of Success. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, we enjoyed having you on a couple of years ago, and we're excited uh, that you're back on the show. I mean, really, habits continues to be a really fundamental part of of living a healthy, happy, productive life. And so, I think the work that you did in, around that field and the work that you're still doing today, I think, is, is extremely relevant. And so, we're excited to jump back in and explore it a little further. Me too. You know, I'd be curious. Uh, obviously, power of habit is. It's been out a while now. Next year is the 10-year anniversary. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say we're pretty close to 10 years. What in the last decade of that book being out, have you, I guess, what have you learned or changed or seen about habits that maybe you would have done differently or you know, people often misunderstand? Or I guess, what are some things that maybe a decade in you would have us contemplate around the habit formation loop? Well, I think one of the really interesting things is, you know, all of us have now lived through the pandemic. And one of the things that we saw during the pandemic, it's always not accurate to say that there's a silver lining to something that's taken so many lives and caused so much upheaval. But one of the things that we have seen is that a lot of people have been profoundly influenced in understanding how transitory habits that they hardly ever thought of actually were and how easily they could be changed, right? So I think one of the things, you know, as we discussed last time, as the power of habit explains, the big insight from science is that every habit has three components. There's a cue, which is like a trigger for the behavior, a routine, which is the behavior itself, and then finally a reward. And the reward is how our brain, particularly the basal ganglia in our brain, learns to kind of chunk those three things together and make that behavior automatic. And about 40 to 45% of what we do every day is a habit. And I think for a lot of people, there were a number of habits that they didn't even recognize in their own lives. There were physical habits, right, about, about how you get to work and how much time you have for exercise. There were mental habits about how your moods rise and fall based on what you're doing and where you are and the people around you. And then suddenly the needle scratched, everything shut down. We started staying home and all of our cues were thrown into chaos. And so there was an opportunity to sort of start seeing some new ways of living that we didn't get to experience otherwise. In addition, there were some rewards that we were exposed to that maybe before we kind of suspected were rewards or we intellectually knew were rewards, but we didn't actually appreciate as rewards. And now we've learned how pleasurable they can be. A great example for me personally is I have two kids, right? And before the pandemic came, I never had dinner with my kids. I always got home too late to have dinner with them. I worked a lot. And I knew that having dinner with my kids like was something I was supposed to do. I knew that it would be fun, 
But I actually did not believe it would be fun because when half the time when you're having dinner with kids, you're like telling them to sit down. You're saying like, can you please use your fork? You know, can you stop hitting your brother? So in theory, it was a reward. And in practice, I did not believe it was actually a reward. I wouldn't have admitted that. But the thing I learned from the pandemic because I did it with my kids every single night is it's actually delightful, right? There's all these aspects of it that are wonderful, And so one of the things that the pandemic gave me is it gave me a chance to learn that all these things that I thought were supposed to be rewarding and I kind of suspected maybe weren't that rewarding actually are wonderfully rewarding. And that, of course, changes my habits. Another good example, and I think this is true for a lot of people I talk to, is I would get on an airplane every 10 days before the the pandemic, right? I was giving speeches all over the, the nation and the world. And it didn't even occur to me to think that there was another way of living. Like I knew that getting on planes was kind of stressful, but I never really, never really thought about how stressful it was. And then all of a sudden that ended, I stopped getting on airplanes and I learned, Oh my gosh, my life is much, much better when I stopped getting on airplanes once a week. I, there's this huge amount of stress that suddenly disappears. The cues that would trigger just low levels of stress, but real stress all of a sudden disappeared. And so I think one of the biggest things that happened is that we have all, through force, through tragedy, had to suddenly come face to face with some habits that maybe we didn't even recognize. And that empowers us. That puts us in a position when, as the world starts reopening, we get to pick and choose which habits we want back and which ones we say, actually, you know what? Now that I recognize the cues and the rewards or the punishments that that involves, I'm just not going to choose it again. Such a great insight. And this idea that I like the way you characterize that because it's not calling it a silver lining isn't necessarily the right way to look at it because it has been so disruptive and traumatic. But I mean, the old proverb, right? Chaos and opportunity are two sides of the same coin, right? And in every upheaval, there's always a chance to clear the slate, to look at yourself, what you're doing, you know, how you can change things. And this has provided so many people an opportunity to really rethink some of the fundamental elements of their lives. And you're seeing all kinds of career pivots and massive transformations. I mean, in your life, in my life, and in everybody's life, we've really had a chance to say, okay, because the record stopped, what are we doing now? And was what we were doing before something that really made sense? And I think you also get to recognize and realize it actually doesn't take a pandemic to make those changes, right? Mm. We all could have made these changes in 2019, oftentimes what happens is because our brain turns off in the middle of a habit, because our neurology is designed to allow our brain to turn off in the middle of a habit, that's why habits are so useful, we stop thinking about whether those habits ought to be choices we're making, whether those habits are things that we ought to embrace. And, and sometimes it has to be forced on us. It has to be forced on us because the entire world shuts down. But other times we can force it on ourselves. We don't have to wait for tragedy. We can instead say, you know what? I, like, I've been feeling like my life is not what I want it to be for six months now. And that's long enough for me to sit down and try and figure out what ought to change. And we now know that we can change. We can change in a week. Yep. I love that. And that's another really important thematic takeaway is this idea that it doesn't take a pandemic for you to pause and reflect and look at your life and say, hey, should I be rethinking some stuff? Is what I'm doing actually working? That's why I'm such a big fan of something like journaling, right? Some kind of methodology for stepping out of the day-to-day flow of your life and actually examining is this the way I should be spending my time? Is this producing the results that I want? And That's exactly right. And in fact, within psychology, they refer to those as cognitive routines, right? Mental habits that force us to think more deeply, particularly when thinking is hard. You know, after I wrote Power of Habit, I wrote a second book called Smarter, Faster, Better, essentially about the science of productivity. Like why, what are the habits that allow some people to accomplish so much more, to be more successful? And the big takeaway from that was that, What's most important is training yourself to think more deeply when thinking is hardest, right? In a moment of stress, in a moment of like exhaustion, in a moment of of anything where it's easy just to kick up your heels and like keep going on autopilot. How do you force yourself to think? Because that's how you choose what is the right thing that I ought to be doing right now rather than the thing that's at the top of my to-do list. And what's really important about that is that we get into the habit of forcing ourselves to think hard by also getting into a habit of doing something that feels like work. If you just take a walk around the lake, that's not actually 
a contemplative routine that's going to help you think hard about what's going on. Journaling, on the other hand, journaling is hard work, right? Your hand gets cramped up. There's a story about West Side Story that I love to tell about the way that West Side Story became this hit was that one of the the playwrights had this habit of going and seeing you know, crazy shows and doing crazy things all day long. And then he would force himself to write these long letters to his friends. The letters are kind of incomprehensible. Like he wouldn't edit them before putting them in the mail. But of course, he wasn't writing them for his friends. He was writing them for himself. And so the more that we identify these mental habits behind innovation or behind focus or or the things that make us productive, the more that we build habits to force us to do that behavior, that's when we truly be, start becoming successful. Because anyone can be busy. There is nothing more wasteful than optimizing something that never should have been done in the first place. The key is not to be busy. It's to get meaningful things done. I couldn't agree more. And that's something that it's amazing how hard it is, especially when you're stuck in that just busy, nonstop, never pausing to think about it mode of being. When you hear, oh, I need to implement contemplative routines into my life. I need to start journaling. I need to start reflecting, thinking. The almost universal knee-jerk reaction to that is, that's a waste of time. That's not making me money. That's not productive. That's not getting me what I want. And yet, if you look at the science, the data, the fundamental lessons of productivity, which you talk about a lot in Smarter, Faster, Better, and actually study high performance you see again and again and again that that is a major recurrent theme across all kinds of high performers, super productive achievers. They constantly implement contemplative routines into their lives. Yeah. And the reason why it like, it like it's so much easier to do that thing. That's kind of immediate gratification is because it feels good, right? It feels good to like plow through your inbox and return 15 emails. In psychology, it's known as a need for cognitive closure, that we can point to something that feels productive, whether it is actually productive or not. And the key is, I mean, it's kind of like exercise, right? Anyone who has not exercised and then starts exercising knows that the biggest thing before you start is like, you're like, I just don't have time. Like, where am I going to get time? It takes forever to like drive to some running path and run for two miles and come back. And then I got a shower and my kids. And yet once you start doing it, you're like, how did I ever get through life? Not running on a regular basis. Like I feel so much better. I get so much more done at work. The proof is there and we know that it's there, but it does take this act of faith, right? It takes this act of belief in ourselves to say, all the evidence is there. All the people are telling me this, even though my lived experience over the last month is, this is going to be like a waste of time. The more we look at these as a series of experiments, the more we end up learning about how the world actually works. And the more we develop the rewards that push us to be the person we want to be. It's funny how we talked about contemplative routines. We talked about exercise and you break down the other big pillars in Smarter, Faster, Better. But it's like the, I get asked all the time, right? I've been doing this show for six years. What are the big hacks that you've learned about productivity and, you know, being more efficient and being successful? And it's like the most boring stuff you could imagine, right? Get more sleep, journal a little bit, work out, you know, take decent care of yourself, exercise. Like there's not, it's meditate maybe like, it's not crazy stuff, but yet this comes back to the question of habits, right? Like, People just don't do it. They're, a lot of times they just don't want to do it. Well, and oftentimes, and this gets back to the power of habit, right? Because this is the fundamental insight, I think, around habit studies. And really what that book is about is trying to to explain this, is that if you don't understand how your own habits work, they're very hard to change, right? Just, just And we know this from experiments, that if you just instruct people, like, if you want to start an exercise routine, right, an exercise habit. So... The first thing is, and a big German healthcare company actually did this experiment to prove that it works, is choose a cue, right? Put your running shoes next to your bed so you see them when you wake up in the morning. Or plan on meeting your friend Fred at the gym every Wednesday night. Choose some cue that is going to trigger your exercise. Do it deliberately. And then when you get back from exercising, 
immediately give yourself a reward. And when this German healthcare plan did it, they told people to give themselves a piece of chocolate right away. Now, this is counterintuitive, right? Because for most of us, we go and we exercise, and then we wait like 30 or 40 minutes before we eat the chocolate because we like to pretend like they're not related to each other. But what the German healthcare company was saying was like, look, give yourself a piece, a piece of chocolate right away. Like, let yourself enjoy that reward. And they were right. They found that about 10% more people exercised after choosing a deliberate cue and choosing a deliberate reward. But now think about how most of us actually start an exercise routine, right? We wake up in the morning, we're like, okay, we go and we find our running stuff because we hadn't laid it out the night before. We get out of the house. We're not exactly certain what route we're going to take. We hadn't planned it, but we run for a couple blocks and we come home. Now we're running late. And so we like jump in the shower. We shower as fast as we can. The kids are going nuts because we've got to give them breakfast. We give them breakfast. We jump in the car to take them to school. We're like sweaty and we like feel super anxious. We get them to school. Then we get to our office 10 minutes or 15 minutes late. And we sit at our desk and we're like, finally are able to like take a deep breath and have a cup of coffee. Basically, what you did is you just punished yourself for exercising. And your brain, your brain is like perfectly calibrated to pay attention to punishments and rewards. There's a there are basal ganglia, which is outside of like, you know, sort of our conscious thought, notices, oh my gosh, if I exercise, it's awful. All I do is get punishments as a result. So it says, I'm not going to make that easier. I'm going to make that harder. But if on the other hand, if everything feels like it's like on greased skids when you go to exercise. Then you come home and you take a nice shower and you, you did it early enough that you have time to go like make a smoothie and drink it. Your spouse is taking the kids to school or it's just you, go, you woke up half an hour early so you have all the time to do this and you get the kids to school on time and you don't feel rushed. Now your brain's like, oh my gosh, this exercise thing is amazing. I want to make that easier and easier and easier. Once you understand how habits work, and that's what the power of habit is really about, is about teaching you how different habits function within your brain, how to identify the cues and rewards and use these levers that have been given to you by science to change how you automatically behave. Once you understand that, then you begin to appreciate, actually, any habit in my life can be changed, and it's not that hard. It's not like it's easy. It's not like I just have to write it on a piece of paper and it happens like magic the next day. But actually, once you know how to start, then it gets a lot easier every single day. This idea of, of these tiny little changes in our environment, right? Putting your shoes out versus leaving them in the closet can lead to such massive behavioral changes. It's so interesting. And yet we often don't think about just making those little tweaks that can cascade into big, you know, those little cues, right, can cascade into big changes in our behavior over time. Yeah. And it's actually known as the science of small wins, right? There's a huge amount of literature that looks at how do people create changes in their life that end up having huge impacts. And in the book, in addition to talking about sort of the research behind the science of small wins, I tell the story of, of Michael Phelps. Because one of the interesting things about Michael Phelps is that if you talk to his, him or his coach, what they'll tell you is that the reason why Michael Phelps has been so successful is because he has built a thousand small habits that allow his days to unfold exactly how he expects them to. So he has a certain way of stretching before he gets in the water. He listens to a certain mix before he gets in the water. He does a certain amount of warm up laps. Everything is completely predictable. And his coach would tell him, look, when you go home, when you're falling asleep, the last thing I want you to do each day, and the first thing I want you to do before you get out of bed in the morning after you wake up, is run the movie in your head. And the movie is Michael Phelps imagining the perfect race. And he imagines it minute by minute. How do you jump in the water? What does it feel like? Like, what are you experiencing halfway through? And as a result, when Michael Phelps actually gets to like the Olympics and he's in the finals, it feels anticlimactic to him. He'll tell you it feels anticlimactic. It is anticlimactic, even when he sets a world record, because he has done it a thousand times already. He's done it in practices. He's done it in his head. He puts the video cassette in his mental VCR, and he watches that movie every single night and every single morning. And that's why he wins, is because it's not a big event. It's not a big deal. It's him living out his habits. He doesn't have to make choices. He just does what he knows how to do so well, and he gets a gold medal. It's amazing that idea of the win is just an outcome of the process, and he focuses on just the process, right? And wins are almost... That's exactly right. And you do get like, you get that little boost on race day, right? That's why he sets a world record on race day and not the day before race day. You get that excitement and that adrenaline. It's not like you're inuring yourself to the fun parts of life. 
but it means you get to experience the fun parts of life because you're not so nervously focused on everything else because it's become automatic. So you touched on this a little bit earlier, this notion of kind of the difference between habits and decisions. Tell me a little bit more about that distinction and how it can trip us up if we don't really understand it. Well, so a habit is a decision that you made at some point that your brain essentially continues acting on without making that choice anymore, right? At some point, you decided to have the unhealthy sandwich for lunch rather than the salad. And it was a deliberate choice. And what happened is that, again, there's this part of your brain, the basal ganglia, that exists to make habits. And your brain looks at that and it says, look, I can save a bunch of cognitive energy just by making that an automatic behavior. So I don't have to think about it again and again and again. And by the way, every animal has a basal ganglia. If we didn't have a basal ganglia, we never would have evolved into humans or into you know, chimpanzees or elephants. The reason why the basal ganglia is so important is because we have to be able to automate a lot of behaviors. If every single time you're walking down the path and you see an apple in a rock and you have to think hard about which one you ought to put into your mouth, you're never going to have time for anything else. You're never going to invent fire or spears or aircraft carriers or video games. So this ability to create habits is instrumental to species success. The problem is that our brain does not distinguish between a good habit and a bad habit. In fact, there is no such thing as a good habit and a bad habit. There's just habits. And then we decide that some of them are healthy for us and some of them aren't. And so unless you somehow get involved in that habit loop, the cue, routine, the reward, unless you somehow step into it and say, I'm not going to let it unfold automatically. I'm just going to make a choice, make a decision, and then let it start spinning on its own again, then you're just you're prey to whatever rewards happen to be around you. The sandwich tastes better than the salad, so I have a sandwich every single day. It feels more fun to look at like YouTube than to get the memo written or to fall asleep or to pay attention to my kids, so I'm just going to look at YouTube. The key is to choose the rewards around us because they drive the behaviors that we want. And then let your neurology take over. Let your neurology make it automatic with the behaviors you like, you've chosen as opposed to the behaviors that just happen to exist. So that comes back to the example you touched on at the very beginning of our conversation, this idea of through the pandemic, maybe we've had an, a chance to reevaluate some of our rewards, right? If you take, for example, having dinner with your family, how would you think about if I discovered this new reward that I really value in my life, how would you think about reverse engineering that into a habit change? You mean like having dinner? Well, I mean... So that's the reward, right? So how do you, if I've discovered this new reward, how do I so use So that's actually not the reward. Mm. The reward isn't having dinner with your kids. That's actually the routine. Got the it. The reward, and this is an important distinction, yep. and I think, I'm glad you brought it up, is the reward is recognizing like, it feels really satisfying to have these conversations with my kids. Like, they're fun to talk to. It's not satisfying immediately. It's not satisfying at first. But once I get to know about them and I know about their lives, I can say like, hey, what did Jimmy say today in class? Because I know Jimmy's kind of a cut up in class. And like, what's going on with like you and Helen? Once you learn about their lives, it's actually really fun to have these conversations and know what's going on inside your kids' lives, right? And so part of it is actually allowing yourself to recognize the reward. There's this thing in, in psychology known as reward salience, where if you decide that something is rewarding, it actually becomes more rewarding. When I tell you that when you decide that you ought to enjoy exercise, exercise becomes more enjoyable. Now, there's some parts of exercise that are independently enjoyable of whether you decide they are or not, right? You're going to feel endorphins and endocannabinoids. There's these neurotransmitters that exercise releases. But oftentimes, we don't actually recognize that we're enjoying those and make the connection until we sit down and say, you know what? Like, I feel good after I exercise. I think exercise is something that is healthy for me mentally. That is when the reward starts having this impact. So the first and most important thing is to sit down and say, okay, what reward is being delivered here? I need to recognize the reward because that's going to make it more rewarding. That's going to help my brain latch onto it. Then the second thing is to figure out, okay, so I've identified the reward and we know that the habit loop is a cue, a routine, and a reward. I know the reward. Now I need to figure out like what the cue is, like what's going on that in my case was preventing me from being able to have dinner with my kids before the pandemic. 
Well, okay. So the way that we do that is I got to figure out like, what was the cue at work that was preventing me from getting home on time? And in my case, what I figured out was inevitably it was that right before I was going to leave work to go home, I would look at my email and there'd be like five emails that I hadn't even read. And I'd be like, okay, I'm just going to like deal with these really quickly. Otherwise they're going to like you know, be preying on my mind. And so I'd sit down and I would deal with them. And as soon as I dealt with five of them, one more would come in because someone would reply, got to deal with that. And it kind of like, then I'm like, ah, you know, I, that reminds me of this thing tomorrow. So for me, since the queue was checking my email, I just made a rule. I'm not checking my email before I leave at work anymore. Like now, because I actually have an office that I go to every single day and did throughout the pandemic, like a closed office. I made a rule that like, once I was within 20 minutes of when I wanted to get home, I turn off my email because I don't want to check it. I know what that queue is going to do. It's going to start a habit that I don't like, which is to sit there in my chair and I want to create a new queue. And the new queue is that at 15 till six, I turn off email and I start allowing myself to think about how nice it's going to be to get home, sit down with my kids, have a cocktail at dinner. I create this queue. I identify this queue. I lean into this queue And I know what the reward is that I actually enjoy having dinner. I've proven to myself that that's rewarding. And the behavior, the behavior to get home on time, it just kind of automatically flows out of that. That's the magic of the habit loop. This is the power of habit, is that once you identify these cues and rewards, you can make behaviors automatic. In psychology, it's referred to as automaticity. And it determines almost half of what we do every day. It's so interesting. Once you develop this ability to start to see your habits, right? And this ties back into what we were talking about earlier around having some contemplative space in your life to actually get visibility into what you're doing and how you're allocating your time and what's happening. But once you're able to start to see those habits, then you have the ability to break them down. And and it's funny, I mean, having spent so much time around habits and, and personal development, I can see it's almost like a, as soon as I see a behavior, I can start to like rebuild, okay, what is this and why am I doing it? And what's the, you know what I mean? You start to think in that way and then you can reverse engineer habits really quickly. Yeah. This army major that I talked to referred to it as having x-ray glasses, right? This was a guy who I used to be a reporter in Iraq during the war. And this is a guy who really first turned me on to like the science behind habit formation. He had been assigned to um, Kufa, which is the city um, about an hour south of Baghdad and been told to stop riots happening there. And he figured out he could stop the riots by removing the food vendors from the plazas. Because if there weren't any food vendors, people would get hungry and they would go home and they wouldn't, <laughs> you, the crowd would never That's get amazing. big enough for a riot to start. And I asked this guy, like, how did you figure this out? Because it would never have occurred to me that like the key to stopping riots is to remove the food vendors. And he was saying that when he was in high school, on the day he graduated from high school, he was trying to decide whether to join the military or to join his brother, who had become a very successful methamphetamine entrepreneur in the region. And his brother actually got arrested. And so he was like, okay, I'm going in the military. So he joins the military. And like the thing about the army and militaries in general is they're giant habit change machines. Actually, like some of the foundational studies on habit formation come from militaries because your natural instinct when someone's shooting at you is to like run away, but they need to teach you this habit of shooting back, returning fire. Or nowadays you can email with, you know, your family every night from a war zone. So if they don't teach you good communication habits, you get into fights and you get distracted when you're on patrol. And so this guy, the military taught him how to see habits everywhere. And he told me it was like they had given him these x-ray glasses that like, this was a way for him to figure out how to parent, how to improve his relationship with his wife, how to train his recruits, not just in like war fighting, but in just life, like how to be responsible young men. This is like the important part of our education is understanding ourselves Right. And, and science now has taught us the power of habit is about and draws its power from the fact that we now understand what is happening inside our heads. There are people, you can change any habit, no matter how old you are, no matter how ingrained there are. There are people right now today who will smoke their last cigarette and will never smoke again or have their last drink and will never drink again. There are people today, somewhere in this world who are going to start a diet today And nine months from now, they're going to be 25 pounds lighter and they're going to be running on a regular basis. This happens every single day. And it usually happens because people have finally learned 
what's going on inside their heads, how to make themselves tick rather than just how they tick. And that's a huge source of strength. That notion that understanding yourself is really the fundamental starting point for self-improvement is such a critical thing to understand. I love the way you put that. I haven't heard it contextualized quite like that. And that idea, it's so simple, but it's so powerful to really realize that if you don't begin with an examination of understanding of who you are, where you are, what you're thinking, then you really don't have the building blocks to change your habits, change your life, and achieve what you want. And we've known this for a long time, right? What's the most famous quote from Aristotle? Know thyself, and to thine own be true. Like the reason why this was the foundation of, of so much philosophy is because much of life is learning who we are and then learning how to use those tools that are naturally given to us to become the person we want to be. Such a great insight. So for somebody who is today stuck with a series of bad habits, right? I mean, maybe you've got a bunch of stuff going on, things you want to change. It can be overwhelming. How do you think about that starting point in terms of where do you begin, right? What's the first step if you've got a smorgasbord of challenges? Yeah. So the, the first thing is, is just choose one behavior, right? Like in the next week, you should not start dieting and start training for a half marathon and like rework, but right? Like let's choose one thing because the science of small wins. We want to get that on our side. We want these, these small victories to propel greater motivation. So let's find one thing that we want to change. And then let's go through this exercise of identifying the cue, the routine, and the reward. And if you want, you can actually like on my website, charlesduhig.com, there's actually these like PDFs you can download. They're like little flow charts. You just fill them out and it helps you identify this stuff. But the first question is, okay, so what's the cue? Almost all cues fit one of five categories. It's usually a time of day, a particular place, a certain emotion, the presence of certain other people, or a preceding behavior that's become kind of ritualized. So let's say you want to change a certain behavior, right? You want to you want to stop having a cookie for a snack in the afternoon, which is something that I struggled with when I was writing this book. So the first thing you do is when you feel that cookie urge, write down those five things. What time is it? What am I feeling? Who else is around me? Where am I? What did I do right before this? And after like two days, it's going to be pretty obvious what the cue is. In my case, it was a time of day. The urge to have a cookie always hit me at like 3.15 or 3.30 in the afternoon. Okay, so I figured out the cue. Now I have to figure out what the reward is, right, from eating that cookie. And when I asked psychologists about this and neurologists, I was like, I know what the reward is. The reward is cookies are delicious. And they were like, no, my friend, you do not understand what you're talking about at all. Because a cookie is like 15 different rewards in one tiny little bundle, right? So is the reward that you're hungry and the cookie is satisfying your hunger? In which case, instead of getting a cookie, go get an apple and see if that satisfies it. Or is the reward that you need like a, a burst of energy and the sugar is giving you some energy, in which case, instead of getting cookie, go get a cup of coffee and that should do the trick. Or is it just like, you just need a break from your desk. And so in that case, you should just get up and take a walk around the block and see if that satisfies. And so what you do is you just like come up with a bunch of hypotheses and for like a week, you just do a bunch of experiments. One day I eat an apple. One day I have some coffee. One day I go for a walk. And, and afterwards, I ask myself, is the cookie urge gone? Like, have I figured out what the reward is? Now, in my case, what I figured out is that when I would go up to the cafeteria, this is when I was working in the New York Times, and get a cookie, I would like go buy the cookie and then I would sit down. There was always people in the cafeteria. I'd sit down with people in the cafeteria and we'd gossip for like 15 minutes. And what I discovered was that it wasn't the cookie that was driving this behavior. The reward was socialization. That's what I was craving. And once I figured that out, once I knew that the cue was a certain time of day and the reward that I was craving was socialization, I could just change the behavior, the routine. And it started from that point on. At 3.30, I'd stand up. I'd look for someone to go gossip with. I'd walk over to their desk. We would gossip for 15 minutes. And I never had the urge to eat a cookie again. And this gets to another important thing, which is we have this unfortunate phrase in our language, which is, to break a bad habit. And what all the research tells us is that's the wrong way of thinking about habits. Because once a habit is in your neurology, it's very hard to break. It's very hard to extinguish. You can do it through willpower, but oftentimes what happens is that 
when you have a moment of stress or a moment of weakness, you'll slip back into that old habit. So the right way to think about this is not to break or extinguish a bad habit. It's to change a bad habit, right? To This is actually known as the golden rule of habit change. To look for what that cue is, to look for what that old reward is, and then to find a new behavior that corresponds to that old cue, that delivers something similar to that old reward, that's going to make it much easier to change. Because instead of just saying, like, in the week, in the afternoons, I'm just going to power through and I'm going to try and extinguish the cookie craving, now I have a new behavior to put into that old habit loop. And that makes it a lot easier. I love that. And this idea of using literally the neural pathways that have already been built and laying on that infrastructure. That's exactly Don't try right. and rebuild the road. Just change, you know, change what you're doing with it. Change the direction a little bit. Yeah, that's exactly right. Such a great insight. Well, Charles, for people who want to find you, your work, more things about you online, what's the easiest place for them to do that? Yeah. So you could definitely buy the book, which is called The Power of Habit. You can find me on Twitter at C Duhig. Just C. My last name is D-U-H-I-G-G. You can come to my website, which is charlesduhig.com. I mean, you can look me up really any way you want. And I will say, if you send me an email, I will absolutely read it and respond. I have a policy that any reader who sends me an email, I respond to it. I think we're like... I don't know, it's like 23,000 emails it's amazing. Were sent back. It's like, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot for 10 years. You start thinking like, oh, that's a lot. That's a big chunk of my life. But it's also because like, I love answering questions and I love hearing these stories. And, and I would say, you know, at least once a week and often more frequently, I get an email from someone who says, I've been struggling with alcohol and I read this book and I figured out what the cue and the reward is and I changed and I haven't had a drink since then. Or I'm now, you know, exercising every day. We tend to think of change as something that's really, really hard. But what all the science tells us is that it's hard when you don't know how to start or do it. All you need is a little bit of knowledge. And then all kinds of changes become within reach. People literally change their lives every single day. Well, Charles, this has been a fantastic conversation. So glad to have you back on the show. Thank you once again for coming on and sharing all these insights. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created this show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or if you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. <laughs>